Uh, hi everyone and welcome to the Defying the Odds webinar with Aqua Security and Commodore. I'm Udi, Devil at Commodore. Uh, before I clear the stage for our amazing speakers, just a bit of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and after the event you will receive an email with the recording and the presentation deck. We will start with a high level overview of the challenges Kubernetes poses for developers talk about best practices and tools to tackle those challenges, and finish with a live demo of Commodore and trivia operator solving real life scenarios. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A tab below or in the chat if uh, you prefer. I hope you'll enjoy our time together and learn new things that will help you all to build more robust and secure workloads in Kubernetes. And so why are we even here? So according to several recent surveys, the two most prominent blockers for Kubernetes adoption in production are one, security, and second one is reliability or day two operation. What's interesting is that the two are very closely related and can actually affect each other. And to unpack this quandary, we've partnered up with our friends of Aqua Security to really understand their Kubernetes security. And um, so without further ado, please allow me to introduce our speakers. To cover the troubleshooting aspect, we've got Commodore's very own DevOps lead, Nir Ben Attar, also known as NBA. He's uh, uh, a DevOps at Commodore and he has uh, vast experience in uh, infrastructure and Kubernetes, and even some security background because he used to work at Cognite before joining Commodore. And um, we also have with us, and she really needs no introduction, she is a CNCF top ambassador, a GitHub star, the woman behind 100 Days of Kubernetes, uh, former SRE at Sivo and the current Dev Advocate at Aqua Security, the one and the only Anais Ulrich. So uh, I'm going to clear the stage and let the real experts talk. So uh, please enjoy and remember to follow Commodore and Aqua and Anais, of course, for more great Kubernetes content. And uh, we'll start off with Nir, so take it away. Yeah. Can you guys hear me well? If you can, yeah. Can you hear me well? Anais, yeah. can you say something so I can, so I can make sure I can hear you? I can hear you perfectly. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. So first of all, very excited to be here uh, together with Anais. This is like kind of my, my debut webinar uh, here in Commodore. And I'm gonna start with a quick, uh, who am I? Um, and uh, I, I feel already embarrassed talking about myself, but I'm just going to go real quick. Um, I'm right now, I'm a DevOps lead at Commodore. I used to be a DevOps group manager at Cognite, like uh, I, I Udi said earlier. Uh, I love Kubernetes. I love automating things. And I play beach volleyball and all kinds of sports, really. Um, and that's pretty much me. I'm not going to talk too much about myself. So I think let's just get to it and talk a little bit about uh, Kubernetes troubleshooting. So let's talk a little bit about what's so great about Kubernetes. I, I believe that most of you guys already kind of know Kubernetes. And if you don't, uh, maybe you can start with Anaisa series about 100 days of Kubernetes to get, get a head start. Um, Kubernetes is really like a game changer. Uh, it became the de facto standard for deploying microservices onto cloud environments. Um, and it's really widely accepted for a good reason. Um, it allows you to uh, increase efficiency uh, by natively uh, distributing workloads onto nodes. Um, it really also scales amazingly almost out of the box using HPAs and cluster autoscalers and kind of, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, its tooling is really gonna allow uh, teams to be super agile and apply DevOps methodologies. And I think in the area and in the, in the era of, of cloud computing, uh, it's already named the cloud OS. And to be frank, uh, as users and admins, we all really kind of love it. Um, so Kubernetes is good. <laughs> this is basically the, this slide. I think the, the dark side of, of Kubernetes is, is that fact that it's pretty complex. Uh, and complexity is fine when things are working. I mean, 
I don't mind that uh, my AC or my air conditioning is, is, is pretty complex as long as it keeps my room chilled at the summer nights, right? Um, I do mind when things go wrong and I wake up in the middle of the night all sweaty and all I'm left with is an abstraction, a remote control without real understanding of what's going on and how to actually solve uh, the fact that I'm actually, my room is really, really hot. So I think because Kubernetes abstracts so many of the concepts that we as sysadmins used to know inside out, uh, when things go wrong, it can be very, very hard to, to trace the root cause or, or the issues uh, in our workloads. So what, what do we do? Uh, we kind of add tooling. And when tooling, and, and then for adding, for tooling, it can also get kind of complex too, because then we need to learn how to use those tooling. And it also has like a, a, a learning curve. So Kubernetes kind of natively kind of abstracts lots of the things that we used to do manually or automatically using like batch scripts or Python scripts or whatever, whatever scripting language that we used to support. Um, but it does have complexity built into it and it requires a learning curve. Um, so what can we do to sort of simplify Kubernetes troubleshooting? Um, so I think trying to say that uh, like in, in a webinar with trying to like giving a 10 minutes is, is, is really trying to, it's not, it's not going to be the whole thing that's going to make your cluster or your Kubernetes uh, uh, workloads uh, reliable, but I'm just going to give a couple of best practices. And the first one is, uh, is what I, I, I think I'm going to call invest into cluster, uh, cluster visibility. Um, so for any distributed system, and especially in Kubernetes, visibility is king. And when it comes to visibility, I'm just going to mention several tools in four main domains. So the first domain that I'm going to talk about is APM, or Application Performance Monitoring. So these tools can be uh, software as a service or uh, self-hosted. So software as a service can be like Datadog or New Relic. Uh, and self-hosted can be like Prometheus Grafana Duo. Um, and why does it increase your cluster visibility is, is several things, okay? So you can, by adding uh, APM, uh, you can add performance metrics to your application and it's gonna allow you to identify how your application behaves in your production lifecycle. How so? Um, for example, once you have your APM in place, you can test your Canary or your Blue Green deployment. Um, so I deployed an application and things kind of, uh, I want to make sure that the new application kind of behaves the same way that I want it to behave. If I have some metrics on, for example, the amount of requests that it's processing on, or uh, the amount of queries that it's performing and the timing for that, I can say that my cannery is actually a good deployment. So uh, this is one reason to add your APM. Um, another good reason to add, to add an APM is you could set your autoscalers uh, to scale on specific uh, metrics instead of like a resource consumption. So for your autoscalers, you could say, okay, um, whenever my pod is reaching, whenever my, uh, my uh, workload is reaching uh, a certain CPU threshold or a certain RAM threshold, then you'd want to autoscale. Uh, but this is kind of vague. Sometimes you want to uh, specifically scale on uh, a specific uh, metric. So for example, the amount of requests that my uh, processing um, microservice is doing when it pulls uh, messages from a queue. So if I know that I have a surge in my requests and this is a metric that I can really, really count on, I could set my HPAs and my auto scalers to make sure that they scale on that specific metric instead of actually just scaling on CPU or RAM. So this is another reason why you'd want to add an APM. Um, and thirdly, obviously, when things go wrong, uh, you do want to get alerts, and you want to you want to make sure that you're bring you brought to attention as an SRE or a DevOps or a production engineer or whatever your name right now. <laughs> um, so when things go wrong, when your when your thresholds or when your metrics kind of get to a threshold or, or reach uh, a certain uh, uh, I don't know percent or, or any 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 limit that you want to set, you'd want to get alerted. So when my uh, uh, time for queries is really is taking too long, or it takes too long for my app, uh, application to load, uh, I'd really want to get alerted as soon as it happens, so I can get to it right away and actually uh, uh, solve my issues really really quickly. 
So this is like the APM domain to increase your cluster visibility. The second domain I kind of want to talk about, if you, the second domain I kind of want to talk about is logging. And logging, like APMs, can have two, uh, uh, like you can have a self-hosted uh, self or you could have like a, uh, a software as a service solution. So software as a, as a service solution can be like Logs.io or ProLogix or Loki. Um, and a self-hosted could be like a FluentD, ELK, that kind of tools. Um, and I think for logging, having a system to capture and present logs is one thing, but making sure these logs are made for a distributed system is another. So basically, you have to make sure as an SRE or a DevOps to, to uh, communicate to your developers and to make them understand what information is required from the logs and making sure that the logs are standardized and the log formats are kind of the same and the severities kind of represent the same things. So when you look at a distributed system with lots of microservices, you have some sort of standard. Um, say you have like a microservice architecture and you're handling like an event flow. Uh, things like making sure you pass through an event ID as part of the logs is gonna make handling uh, issues really, really so much easier if you could just like filter by an, an event ID and then having to go through all the microservices and looking for a specific event ID. So having a system is one thing, but having a standard of what logs are meant to be and, and what they're supposed to do is, and is, is really gonna increase your cluster visibility. The third domain I kind of wanna talk about is alerting tools. Um, so alerting tools, uh, things like PagerDuty, OpsGenie, or even like a Slack sync uh, are really, really important for you to really once your APMs kind of hit a threshold or once you have an alert for a specific log on your logging mechanism, you really want to make sure that you're, you're ready with playbooks for the specific alert type, right? So you want to make sure that the system, you have a system in place to actually call you in the middle of the night and wake you up and actually get you to do what you're doing uh, 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 and to solve the issue. This is the third domain, alerting tools. And the last one, last and, and, and not least, is actually spe specialized uh, Kubernetes tools. So APMs and loggings and, and alerting tools are relevant for everything, not just Kubernetes. You can have them for uh, serverless. You can have them for, uh, I don't know, uh, legacy EC2s or anything like that. So spe specialized uh, Kubernetes tools are gonna, like Komodo, are actually specifically designed to give a user context for a Kubernetes resource or an event. Um, and it's gonna provide you with the user with actionable data to act upon before and when things go wrong. So uh, these are kind of the four main areas when I want to talk about uh, a cluster visibility. The second best practice I kind of want to talk about is uh, making sure you standardize your process and, uh, processes and tooling. So um, Kubernetes is like an amazing community, right? And it has amazing people developing amazing tooling. And as a DevOps engineer, my, my fun or my, my cup of tea is to look through DevOps newsletters and subscribing to DevOps influencers like Anais and going to conventions. And the amount of tooling for Kubernetes is almost like overwhelming. And as a DevOps engineer, we like to try everything out, right? We, we deploy to local clusters and check things out. And, and it's almost like in our nature. And something we have to look out for when we're planning our production infrastructure and processes around Kubernetes is is making sure that we identify uh, tools that have the same objective. Uh, I'm just going to give like a quick object, uh, a quick example. So there's like the objective of defining different values for your environments, right? Your prod and your staging and your tests and your load environments may have like different values and configurations or image versions or secrets or all kinds of differentiations between your environments. And you have several tools for, for dealing with this objective. You have like Helm and Customize, and both of them kind of try to tackle the same problem. In some cases, Helm is more suitable and some customize. But if we were to incorporate multiple tools answering the same objective, we'd be adding a, a level of complexity to our development or support, uh, support site, uh, cycle. What do I mean? Like, what, what's an example if I have like both Helm and customize? So imagine a CI pipeline for an application. And then as a part of the CI pipeline for, for the application, you want to linter and to go through the YAMLs or, or your resources uh, uh, definitions to make sure that they're sane before they're deployed, right? So if I'm using Helm and Customize, I'd have to use two different linters. I have to maintain different linter configurations. Uh, and then I'd have to do extra work and complexity becomes like a native thing that I have to do if I have to support an application with both 
of solutions tackling the same problem. If I if I had to look at the deploy command and I'd have to wait for a resource to be ready, I'd do like a dash dash wait on home and then I do a kubectl wait on a, cube, on, a, on a customized deployment. And then this is just for like CI operations. Imagine like day two operations, like having to roll back. So, you know, like Helm provides you with a, with, with a rollback uh, out of the box mechanism, but customized doesn't. And then what if I had to roll back a, a complete application with, with some customize and some Helm into it? It really brings in so much more complexity when you have two solutions for the same objective. So this kind of applies for every single like objective that you're trying to achieve with tooling in, in, in Kubernetes. So how do I manage secrets? Do I use sealed or extendable secrets? Uh, how do I scale? Do I just use a vanilla HPA or, or Kata? Or do I use a service mesh? Do I use Linkerd or Istio or both? I think the bottom line when we're talking about standardizing uh, uh, Kubernetes resources is experimenting is great and performing proper POCs for tooling is essential. And frankly, it's really, really super fun. Um, but when we're choosing something to be run on our production infrastructure, we want to make sure that we don't use different tools for solving the same objective. Um, so that's like the second part, uh, uh, standardizing Kubernetes processes and tooling. And I think that really it applies to not just troubleshooting or like the tools that you mentioned, but really any tool in the cloud native space that there's for most tools. If not every tool, there's an alternative that does something similar, right? And the way you are talking about Helm versus Customize, it's you can talk about it that way because you know the difference, because you had the option to look at both tools, right? Yeah. But most people who are getting started, especially, or who are looking for a specific solution, for instance, if you're looking for the first time a Commodore, right? And you're looking at similar tools, you don't know yet how to reason about Commodore versus, like the way you reason right now about customers versus Helm. This is really complex when you're just getting started with a new tool, when you're exploring a new tool. That's Similarly, right. when you're looking at security scanners, you will have to invest some time into looking at the different tools and start reasoning about what does this do versus another, right? And um, that's that's gonna be something that's uh, that will apply for every tool out there, right? Not just like, Helm versus customize or or tools like that, but really any tool that you want to deploy in your cluster, you should actually go ahead and reason about it. Okay, what does it give me that other tools don't give me versus um, what does it not give me? I completely agree. I think that my point uh, specifically was do do research, do your POCs, do make sure that everything is kind of yeah. Uh, in the right place, uh, and you can reason why you chose a specific solution, but make sure that you don't experiment in production for both solutions because trying trying to solve the problem is only is only half of the uh, half of the solution having to support it in in terms of the entire delivery and and day two operation pipeline is going to be costly and it's going to cause some issues uh, uh, if you actually support both of them as part of your production infrastructure do that on your test environment do that on your staging environment fine uh, but once you go to prod make sure that you have one solution to solve a specific problem Um, my next uh, kind of uh, uh, best practice is to treat Kubernetes uh, uh, resources like code. And I think, I know, I know we're talking about uh, inf uh, infrastructure as code. It's really, very really fluffy. Everyone's talking about it. I know. <laughs> but using code best practices is really going to help you as an SRE or a DevOps engineer to put safeguards in place to prevent untested changes from actually rolling out to production. Um, so things like performing PRs properly, like asking the right questions as part of your, your, your pull request, um, use your linters, um, have proper CI pipelines, make use of admission controllers, um, having multiple environments for testing purposes and uh, down the line uh, staging environments and QA environments, and then only then reach a prod specifically for Kubernetes resources is really, really important. Uh, because my thesis is things kind of break due to many, many reasons, but the main reason kind of kind of things break is changes and we like changes, right? We, we push towards shifting left and making sure that changes are really, really easy for developers to do right now. Um, but we as an SRE, as SREs or, or DevOps engineers, we're like the protector, protectors of the production environment. And we must practice like good code hygiene and best practices to make sure that we're on the right place in terms of 
uh, on how we can treat our production environment. Also, like a good like a good example for for treating Kubernetes resources like code is make use of of RBAC. So just like you wouldn't let anyone merge into your master branch without uh, going through a PR and having approval, uh, and just like you you would block that right away. You shouldn't let you shouldn't allow any you shouldn't allow anyone to like change your cluster state on your production namespace production environment that actually is gonna be uh, where the customer is actually uh, uh, there. <laughs> So this is the third, the third kind of uh, uh, best practice. Um, in terms of a conclusion, I think ensuring the right, the right foundation to, to your uh, Kubernetes environment from the get go is really going to ease the process of troubleshooting uh, down the line. It's going to help you move faster, increase ownership, and uh, bring more value to your customer. So now after talking uh, a million, <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> just gonna transfer over to, to Anais, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, and I'm gonna let her talk a little bit about security and Kubernetes. Awesome. I don't think I have that much to say. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure, I will try. <laughs> um, can you get to the next slide, please? Slide master, slide uh, maintainer. <laughs> yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, quick overview of me. Um, I actually, I didn't start in the space, right? I got started in the space at the end of 2020 um, after I got tired from the from working in the blockchain space, but I was working in the blockchain space on open source projects. Then when I joined the cloud native space, I was first not working primarily on open source projects, uh, but that changed when I uh, got started Aqua Security at the beginning of the year. So um, now I'm there open source developer advocate. Uh, you mentioned a few times that reliability engineering, I worked as SRE last year, taught myself at it, uh, but I missed the developer advocacy side of things. It's kind of, it's for me, the, I don't know, <laughs> I love it. Uh, you, get, you get paid to learn. So I got back into developer advocacy. Um, I also have a YouTube channel and weekly newsletter. So if you're curious about that, check it out. I actually finished, I, I didn't do 100 days of Kubernetes. Um, <laughs> I did a bit less of a few days, but you can still follow me for new content. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> can you, next slide, please. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm talking now about Kubernetes security. Um, if you look online at my previous presentations, you will see me have talked about multiple different topics from GitOps, CICD pipelines, to all of kinds of things. And this year, I... Um, I got started with cloud native security. However, I think I should have gotten started way earlier when I got started within the cloud native space. Um, and I'm going to tell you why, because it's actually, well, it is hard, but it's not as hard as you might think. It's it's similar to getting started with any other cloud native tool out there. And that sounds really like as a way of simplifying it. But ultimately, when you get started with observability, you might get started with observability tools and you learn how to use them. But for a long time, you won't understand them inside out. And it's similar to security. When you get started with cloud native security, at the beginning, you will not understand everything, everything that there is to cloud native security, and you don't have to, to get started with it. Um, but because there's kind of the stigma around it about security being reserved for a group of people who are already experts or like um, more proficient within a specific field, uh, people kind of stay, try to stay away from it, um, which is actually <laughs> a problem <laughs> because we need more security experts, more people who understand how to use them and how to integrate the tools that also I'm going to show you from Aqua, from our open source project, into your stack, into other tools such as Commodore. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the thing is why it's so difficult kind of to touch upon that more detail um why it's so difficult to get started with cloud native security is that there are multiple different components that will factor into how you approach security for your project and how you manage um security tools so the space of role is moving very very quickly and security is not necessarily the thing that will help you to navigate the space better, right? It's something else that you will have to keep up with versus tools such as Commodore, troubleshooting tools, observability tools. They will help you to, um, to understand what's going on, basically. Security tools will need you to be more proactive with everything going on. You will have to proactively look into what new CVEs mean, what new uh, misconfiguration issues appear within your environments and so on. It's nothing that's going to be shown to you out of the box 
Um, then the other thing is that there are multiple different stakeholders, open source and of propriety software uh, that have all different interests, right? They have different priorities. And a lot of companies don't necessarily focus on um, investing into security and into security teams. It's something that might be managed at the end of a sprint in a few days that might or might not remain. Who knows, right? And then the next thing is obviously um, security is considered to be very difficult to get started with. And that's also uh, due to a lot of the tools being very immature in this space, right? Like lots of cloud native tools, they are open source first and they are not necessarily having the best user experience and they're difficult to navigate, right? So <laughs> that's why you might not want to or enjoy even looking at them and using them. Um, then the last two things are that the tech stack that you might have originally um, is very complex and might not have a security tool out of the box. So you might have to learn how to use security tools related to your tech stack. And then the other thing is that not every tool will have existing integrations available, which will require you to also build those. Next slide. And this is kind of related to, to the user experience of security tools. And that's also how I feel getting started with a lot of cloud native tools that the documentation will tell me one thing, do X. And when I try to do X, it's not there. It doesn't work. The instructions don't match what I'm seeing inside of my cluster, right? And I can tell a little bit of a story as well, like preparing for this webinar, I was trying to use a tool that was um, less mature and I thought, oh, it's going to be easy to just configure it, but it wasn't there out of the box and it just didn't make much sense on the way it's supposed to be configured. So mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that actually happens a lot, right? And, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Totally <laughs> and this is the thing is the funny thing is when I count this GIF, it's meant to be as a joke, but it's in the text, but it's a real problem that, right, that people tell you that you have to press this or do that. And it just doesn't exist. It's not there, it's not out of the box there. Every tool has to be configured differently. Next slide. So here just some of the um, tips that kind of more in terms of soft skills and priorities of how you can approach security in an easier way, but I use open source tools from Aqua Security or other open source tools, doesn't matter, but kind of something that I would recommend you to do. Next slide. <laughs> so the first thing is always look at what you use, right? Um, there's a lot you can do early on when you choose different resources, when you're developing your application. So um, different people throughout the development life cycle, if you're working within a team, can focus on securing different aspects of your stack, of your infrastructure. Um, but ultimately, the the main theme here is that don't just trust things you find online. Lots of it is um, open source and you have to look into it, how it's maintained, who maintains it, what are their objectives as well. Um, so validating what you use, how you use it, what you deploy is always better than just going ahead and trusting um, those tools, right? Um, <laughs> even okay. if a tool has millions of downloads, it could always be something. Um, so looking at the individual components that you're using and trying to understand their security, potential security issues um, will help you down the line, even if you don't understand and you don't have to understand every detail of those potential security risks. Next slide. Another thing is that we can, or that we should do is, um, and that's kind of related to shifting left. Shifting left is a great thing, but um, ultimately the thing is, or my, I have some problems with, with, the, with the theme itself, because a lot of times it results in engineers and people who have a different day-to-day -day job having to do more work. And that's not, that shouldn't be the goal, right? If you just um, say everybody, every engineer should do everything or should be empowered to do everything, then you might end up in a situation where nobody does anything. And <laughs> that's, that's a big issue. So definitely empower people within your team, but also assign responsibilities and ownership of those tasks. Um, like everybody should be able to contribute, but there should be a clear path on how to contribute and uh, ownership of when to contribute, for example, to the security of your infrastructure, of your, of your tools. Next slide. I, I just want to say I completely agree yeah. on this point. I think having, having everyone being able to contribute is one thing, but having a, a designated area of responsibility for specifically security, but also other things, 
uh, is really going to help you also empower the people. So once you're going to try and contribute to a specific area, if you have someone to discuss with, discuss with and, and talk about and get uh, uh, advice on how to actually implement that, it's really, really important for you to be able to shift left this the decision tree. So I, I completely uh, I'm strongly a plus one on this on this point. The thing is also like with, for example, I would use Commodore if I'm already in a situation where I have to figure things out, right? Where I have to understand things better. So it, it proactively helps me with my job, right? Mm -hmm. Versus security tools, often they just add additional tasks to your job, <laughs> which is also the difference, right? Of like how those tools have to be approached differently. Um, yeah, and then the last thing is that automation is great, but obviously, <laughs> and if you watch this episode of, of The Simpsons, you see that, it, that it can also easily fail, such as this uh, little bird just flipping over and not being able to press the key anymore. And that's also how a lot of automation pipelines um, might end up, that automation is great, but only up to a certain level um, and also only up to the level that you understand it, right? It won't cater for edge cases necessarily. It won't um, do the proactive tasks for you either. So those are the, the main themes. Um, now in the next thing is the demo, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think specifically for automation, I think you said you said correctly. It's not like a, once you automate one, one sort of task, you're done with it, right? It's, ne it's, never, it's never the case. You're like, okay, you automate one, one use case and then your automation kind of breaks. And then you automate another part of your pipeline. And then, well, there's a different edge case which kind of, which kind of breaks the, the whole concept. Um, so automation is not like a, a silver bullet, which kind of solves the whole, the whole, uh, the whole solution. You'd always have to revise those automated processes. You have to make sure, especially for security, that they're up to date and they're actually validating the right, uh, uh, say, uh, I guess the latest uh, versions of the CVE repositories or, or all kinds of that kind of stuff. You have to make sure that they're up to date and you have to give, the, give them some care and love. So once you automate a process, it's not like you're over and done with. You have to continuously make sure that these processes are going to work and they're still valid. And also understanding when those processes fail, right? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's let's do a demo, Anais. Are you, are you excited about the demo? Very excited. <laughs> I am. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think I'm just going to give like a quick overview about how um, Commodore can help you. Uh, and we're just going to talk about two different scenarios. If I could just get my screen to work. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. I think so. All right, cool. Okay, so first off, uh, this is Commodore. Commodore is, is, is quite the platform and I am kind of like in love with it. So I'm a bit biased, but I think it's a really, really good platform for someone who's trying to understand um, what's going on in their cluster and tr trying to debug a specific solution. I'm going to talk with two hats. So the first hat is like a, an SRE or a DevOps engineer who's trying to look and get an overview of, the, of their system. And then the other hat is going to be a specific developer working on a microservice trying to solve a, a specific problem in their environment. So I put on the DevOps hat. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm now looking at what we call the events page. And the events page is, is something that's going to allow us uh, as an SRE or, or a DevOps engineer to make sure that they have a bird's eye view of, of everything that's happened inside our system. This includes different clusters. Uh, I can filter them out. This includes all the namespaces and all the clusters and includes all the services that I have. And I have like a really, really cool widget here, which I could select time from and to to see all the events in that period of time. Uh, so I could just like pick this and this and, and see a specific amount of events. Um, so I'm just going to look at the specific event here. I'm just going to pick a random one. Um, and this is an availability issue. And in this availability issue for a specific service, I can see that there was an umkill. And as part of this really, really cool feature that Commodore is, is, is showing, I'm going to see the, the logs from, from, where, from where the uh, uh, pod actually failed. So you know how different, uh, instead of having to log on and trying to figure out exactly what happened in my log scenario, I can get the right context of what this, when this happened and get the right logs for that. And I can look and see exactly what happened and see with the pod events. 
and all kinds of really, really cool stuff, which is going to give me a good snapshot of what happened at that time. Um, so now if I'm just going to pick this specific service and see all kinds of other stuff that I can see here, um, let's just pick like a deploy event. So lots of stuff, lots, lots of stuff that Commodore is going to help you try and get context of is what happens during a deploy. And because Commodore is an agent that's installed in your cluster, uh, you get uh, a diff of everything that's changed inside your uh, uh, between deploys. So we, we get a specific diff of uh, any annotation or environment variables uh, or limits which are changed as part of the deploy. And then you can get visibility on to what happened when you did this change. But a really, really cool feature that Commodore is gonna, is, is gonna show is an integration with GitHub. So if you incorporate uh, uh, your uh, GitHub, uh, uh, say a Git SHA reference as part of your CI pipeline, you can get for each deploy exactly what happened between the last deploy. So in this deploy, a guy who, who's an engineer here at Commodore, he changed like a cache mem size. And I can, I can, from this deploy, I can see what happens inside the image, which is really, really cool because this caching service is actually not, I, can, I can't see this when I just log into Kubernetes. I had to go to Git and understand what happened. And this is gonna shorten my way into understanding what happened in this deploy. Um, so this is like my, my hat as a uh, SRE looking at the entire system and having to filter specific events and trying to understand what goes on. And Kuben and Commodore gives you great visibility for that. So when I switch my hat to uh, uh, a developer and I'm, I'm just gonna say that I'm looking at the specific environment. Um, I'm, let's say I'm working on, on a service called Events Pooler, right? Um, events, events Pooler is a deployment uh, and Events Pooler has uh, a configuration defined in a config map, which says, uh, the amount of uh, API rim API limits, and let's pretend like I'm working on a feature which which is going to increase the API rate limit. Uh, so I can see that the API rate limit is actually configured in the config map. But while I was working on that on that uh, feature, someone called me just in the open space and said, "Okay, something is going on in your production infrastructure. There's a deployment to failing or something like that." And because I'm a good SRE or good DevOps engineer, I just do really a quick change to production. And I'm trying to figure out exactly what's going on. So I change my context. I like go to deployments and see what's going on in the failed service, right? Uh, and, and I check it out. I'm, I'm, I'm just like checking it out, seeing what's going on, looking at logs, uh, seeing stuff like, okay, I'm gonna say something to Udi saying, look, your data sync is, is out of, out of, it's not there. It's not in the image, check something out. And then I try to kind of go back to what I'm doing, right? Um, but as part of what I'm doing, I kind of forgot that I changed the contents and I kind of changed the config map in the production environment. So I'm just going to do that real quick. So I'm just going to change the API rate limit to something big. And then as part of doing that, uh, I also want to kind of scale it out because I, I know that my events pooling is kind of slow. So I'm going to go to my deployment and I'm going to scale that out to like 10. Why not? So while I do that, I can kind of go to Commodore and see what it kind of looks like from my perspective as a developer. So I can go to my services view and look at the events spooler. And straight away, what I can see is looking at best practices of what happens in my deployment, even without anything happening, right? I can see that I have issues with uh, memory limits. Just, just my deployment doesn't have any memory limits and no CPU limits. This is really important for me, actually, when I'm looking at the, uh, at the uh, deployment. It's going to help me make my deployment better. Uh, when we don't have memory limits or CPU limits, our quality of service that we're getting for our, for our workload is, is versatile. Uh, which means that if our node is going to be uh, over occupied with all kinds of nodes, with all kinds of uh, uh, workloads affecting all kinds of uh, uh, CPU and memory consumption, it could actually be evicted. Um, and we really don't like that. So we want to make sure that this is stuff that we alert on. The second alert is saying that the tag is, is not specified. And it's true. I have a latest tag and it's a really, really bad practice. It means that whoever pushes that, it's going to automatically pull 
uh, uh, onto the deployment. So I don't want that. So if I was a good developer and I looked at the screen, I would, I'd, I'd make sure that things are actually working fine. So going back to what we did earlier, uh, we, we did a deploy uh, and we changed we change the amount of replicas. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, from, from one to 10, right? But something really, really cool that Commodo is doing because Commodo kind of knows what, uh, uh, so we've only changed the deployment, right? We've only changed the, the replica set. Or, or the amount of replicas for this deployment. But Commodore is aware that this deployment is actually using a config change uh, or a config map for, for the API rate limit. And it's gonna show me that things are actually changed in this deployment. And it kind of correlates that together with the deployment to make sure that we're actually shown the, get the, the context of everything that's changed for that specific deployment. And it's gonna give you a good idea of what's going on. Um, so I think, I think that's mostly it, what I kind of want to display here in Komodo. I'm going to get the stage over to, uh, Anais and going to show a little bit about the operator. Okay. Anais, do you want to share screen or? Yes. All right. Fingers crossed it's going to work just fine. Okay. You can yeah. see the screen? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is Trivi. Trivi is our all-in-one security scanner. Uh, with Trivi itself, you would usually go ahead and you would install um, the Trivi CLI and you would use the CLI directly uh, through the terminal or you would use a CSD pipeline and use the CLI through the, the client tool through that. Um, the thing is that this is obviously focused more on engineers scanning security resources. The CLI tool is not focused on um, cluster admins or security professionals who want to see what's going on inside your Kubernetes cluster. So, we have an additional two Trivi. We have the Trivi operator. And the Trivi operator is basically a set of Kubernetes custom resource definitions. So uh, basically Kubernetes resources that you can um, deploy to your Kubernetes cluster to extend the Kubernetes API. That's ultimately what um, we talked about at the beginning of the talk, that um, the power of Kubernetes is really that it's so extensible and that you can deploy pretty much any application to your cluster and extend and build upon the Kubernetes API to retrieve information as well as push, in, push information to your cluster. Um, now, for those who are new to Kubernetes operators, this is basically how it looks within your cluster. So you have your Kubernetes cluster and then you have um, a controller, which is kind of the operator living inside your cluster that's kind of deployed through a set of YAML manifests. And a controller operator in Kubernetes usually has a specific task. It's one of those automation tools that's supposed to automate a human task that's usually done by somebody uh, manually. Um, now, this is all done within your Kubernetes cluster. So anything that's living within your Kubernetes cluster, it will just build upon that. So for instance, the trivia operator lives inside of your Kubernetes cluster, and then it can scan, for example, your deployments for vulnerability issues and other issues uh, within your cluster. Now, right now, it's scanning configuration issues within your cluster and vulnerability issues. We're going to extend it to do additional scans. But ultimately, at this point, everything is within your cluster. And I'm just going to show you how that looks like. So here's my terminal. I just have to move the screen, otherwise I don't see you. Um, Let's see, is it gonna open? <laughs> you did yeah. well in opening it before. Um, okay, so here's my um, operator service, but ultimately if I go to parts, um, I have here all the events polar that <laughs> we just upscaled. Um, and then we have here the trivia operator within our demo namespace. And the trivia operator is just another Kubernetes deployment that's living within you. And whenever there is a new um, container image detected within the cluster, within this namespace specifically, it's going to do a vulnerability scan. And that's going to be saved, the vulnerability scan. Uh, it's going to be saved as a CRD, as a Kubernetes custom resource definition called vulnerability report. So we can query the cluster for vulnerability reports and we see our vulnerability reports from within that namespace. So for instance, I have here of my example application, um, a vulnerability report, and it has five critical vulnerabilities, 33 high vulnerabilities, 11 medium vulnerabilities, and so on. Now, this is kind of an overview that you can see through a tool such as KNNS. You can also use other integrations such as Lens to view those vulnerability reports, or you can also see um, the um, 
the operator itself through Commodore. And that's just the beauty of it that um, while you're using the trivia operator, you would still want to use um, and you have to use all kinds of other monitoring solutions and troubleshooting solutions to see what's going on within your cluster. Um, so the trivia operator is kind of living within your cluster and then you would want to set up alerting rules and other rules to be notified whenever there are changes, whenever there's a new vulnerability report, for example, with critical vulnerabilities, that's when you want to get notified, but it shouldn't be something that you actively uh, have to go and check. You just want to be notified, for example, in Commodore if the trivia operator is down, because then it can't run new vulnerability scans and then it can't notify you of new critical vulnerabilities within your cluster so you want to be notified when a trivia operator doesn't work as it's expected and you want to be notified um, additionally if there are critical vulnerabilities for instance within your cluster of new reports um, now this is in this example application that I deployed here there are those critical vulnerabilities that doesn't tell you a lot you can then also query um the yaml of that um vulnerability report and here you will then see the details of um all of the vulnerabilities that are within and you can also see within the within the url you can see more details about that specific vulnerability um, and ways to fix it now i've set in this case the operator to only show us vulnerabilities that can already be fixed so it will only report here vulnerabilities that can already be fixed and um, i fixed that in a new container image so over here this is the container image that's just deployed that's just running within my kubernetes cluster that uh the trip operator scanned within our Kubernetes cluster. Now I did a new Commodo demo. Uh, I did a new container image and I just called it the good image. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, we can go now we can now go ahead and we can update our deployment within our cluster. So I can go ahead and say kubectl apply and then it's within the manifest folder I think it's everything is this a trivia no this is the wrong repository let me open the right let me open this terminal so and then you see here other things that i tried okay so over here i want to now deploy the manifest update so i'm going to say kubectl apply um file and then it's within deployment and manifests so i'm just gonna apply it to our demo um playground playground thank you otherwise <laughs> not gonna work um the updated container image and now we can go back to our cluster and we can see the updated container image running within our cluster as part of this deployment hopefully and here's already our our vulnerability scan so once let's go back to pods so once there's a new deployment um the trivia operator will run a job that's basically scanning our new deployment, in this case, um, our new container image that we just deployed um, to the cluster. So when we go back to vulnerability reports, we can then see the new vulnerability report here. And in this content, like in the updated container image, uh, we don't have any critical or high vulnerabilities or any other vulnerabilities that have a fix available now there might be vulnerabilities within that container image that don't yet have a fix available meaning they're just vulnerabilities that are known of in this space that have cvs available but they are not you can't proactively fix them or like the um, maintainers of the base image that i'm using can't fix them yet um, so that's what it means ultimately um yeah and this is all this is what the trivia operator does <laughs> The new cluster. Any exactly. questions? I think I have I have like a question because it's, it's one of the first times that I'm yeah. seeing a uh, 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 trivia operator. So yeah. you, you mentioned that uh, there uh, it's not going to show a, a vulnerability if it's not going to be fixed. How how is it distinguishing between the ones that can be fixed or can't be fixed? So let me maybe go ahead and um, what can I scan? Um, do I have, so for instance, um, let me scan this container image, the previous one. Mm -hmm. And then I can show you how that works. Now, was it React example app, something like this? Um, Make eight. 8 .0 .0. So I can take this container image and I can use in this case, I'm going to use the Trivi CLI. 
And with the Triple CLI, I can scan any container image. I don't have to have it locally. Yeah. Um, so for instance, before I deploy or choose container images, I can go ahead and scan them. So you can say Trivi image, and then I can scan my container image. So this is going to go ahead and it's going to pull the container image for default is Docker Hub, um, but it can also choose any, you can choose any other container registry. Now it's going to scan that container image and it's going to list all of the vulnerabilities and it's going to classify them, whether they're critical, high vulnerabilities, low vulnerabilities, whatever they are. Now, Trivi knows which version is installed within the container image and it can see based on its vulnerability database, if this vulnerability has already been fixed. And this is the fixed version, but the fixed version is not used within a container image. Mm -hmm. And that's how Trivi basically has um, the Trivi database. That's also open source tool. So let me just move this away. Uh, <laughs> so within the Acry security Git repository, we have uh, Trivi and we have the Trivi database. Um, which is a separate project, but which Trivi uses under the hood. And it's basically pulling from a list of different resources, vulnerabilities um, on a six hour period. So every six hours, it's updating its vulnerability databases and it knows then uh, if there are new vulnerabilities or if vulnerabilities that didn't have a fix available before now have a fix available. And that's how it can provide you this information. The thing is, as you can see, um, this list is just one container image and it's very long. Now, yeah. if you have multiple container images running off in your cluster or you have um, larger container images, like if I would go ahead and scan an older version of Ubuntu, um, <laughs> I would have lots and lots of more vulnerabilities. So it would basically spam me with vulnerabilities, some of which might have a fix available, some of which might not. So I want to specify um, whenever I say Trivi image, I want to specify um, that I only want to see uh, container images that have a fix available. So right. I can say, yeah, go ahead. This is a configuration you can also set for your operator, obviously. Yes, exactly. So that's what I actually said in the operator that I want to say, uh, ignore unfixed. Yeah. Um, true, I always, like, I want to ignore all of the unfixed ones. It doesn't, like, it's not gonna make a difference to me if there are unfixed vulnerabilities uh, mm -hmm. within my cluster. That's that's ultimately that. Um, so that's how Trivi makes a distinction between fixed and unfixed vulnerabilities and the Word. ones that are shown. Um, Word. Yeah. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the the people in the in the webinar uh, the the participants an option to ask some questions, and if not, I can have I have another question if you don't mind. <laughs> so it looks like a. All right, I'm just gonna mute. Yeah. yeah. Looks like a Q and A tab is empty. Um, Last chance for anyone in the audience to raise a question to Neil or Anais or myself. Oh, so I think uh, Neil, you got a chance to ask your question. I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, my, my DevOps mind is thinking. So <laughs> Anais, is, is, can Trivi operator also uh, handle as an admission controller? So can I, can I not allow a... Uh, 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 a, uh, deployment to, to enter my cluster if it has vulnerabilities, or is it something that I should include as part of my CI pipeline as a, as a command line? You would want to use that as part of your um, pipeline to say if the container image has certain vulnerabilities, even you can specify if it has certain like specific types of vulnerabilities. Um, and you can also now with Trivi, with the latest version, you can uh, configure like Trivi plugins. So you can say, you can specify, for example, additional um, configuration files that um, through which Trivi can know whether or not the vulnerability, vulnerability also affects your specific resources. So a lot of times we have flooded with vulnerabilities, but they might not actually um, affect our resources, right? Yeah. Like they might be there, but actually, like if you, especially if you use certain combination of older versions of different types of uh, tooling, right, then you're not going to be affected by those vulnerabilities. And you might want to know that, especially if um, it's quite uh, a hassle to update those resources, right? So you can um, also scan for, yeah, as part of your pipeline, basically, whether or not those vulnerabilities affect you. Um, that's what you would do, but it's not like, um, automatically 
doing that. Like you will have to run the steps and you have pack. to configure it like as part of your automation. Yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. Cool. Woody, I think you can take the stage. Do you have a question for me or someone? Do I have a question? Um, oh, I told you I have bad questions. <laughs> Okay, I'll what's next for Commodore? What's next? Yeah. Think, wow, it's a, it's a it's a very big question. I don't know it's if about, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's it's know. To answer. I think I think a really a really cool thing that we're trying to do next is trying to give uh, a DevOps engineer or a developer the right context for different kind of issues. So, for example, if we're trying to understand uh, network issues, if we're gonna give like a a, a good context of all kinds of resources that are related to network or if we're checking out we're looking at persistent data uh, 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 and we have different kind of resources which relate to that so we want to give a, spe a specified dashboard for that uh, that together with showing all kinds of other resources across multiple clusters and having the ability to manage uh, multiple clusters and seeing the difference between them uh, is what we're kind of working on right now I think Commodore is really, really exciting. And I, I know that the new features that are coming through are going to be super cool for, for anyone who's trying to try understand what's going on uh, in terms of uh, troubleshooting. And I'm excited for what's ahead. So continue logging in, seeing, look, look at other webinars. We're going we're gonna to show some surprises next. That's it. Thank everyone for joining us and thanks Mir and especially Anais for uh, joining us and just following everyone with your knowledge and experience. I uh, hope everyone who joined in learned uh, at least something, uh, at least one new thing today. And like Mir said, keep checking in. We're uh, constantly growing and changing and uh, improving, uh, same as uh, Aqua. So uh, stay in touch. Follow on nice on Twitter, and we're gonna have a toast to have. A <laughs> wow, Anais, you're not ready for that either. We're, we're... No. Uh, what did you prepare have... without me? You should have let me know. It was a mid session. I don't know. I, I just, I just see like a shot. Just, just... bring you that. <laughs> no, I mean, this is Udi. This is the the perks of working with Udi. He just brings you random right stuff. He just here. brings you random shots as part of your web. <laughs> Yeah, so cheers. <laughs> cheers, Anais. Cheers. Think... <laughs> all right. To you, and may we always have secure and reliable clusters. And <laughs> with this, we will leave you. that. <laughs> Amazing. Bye. Bye. See you, Anais. Take care. Bye. Thank Come you. On. Bye.